Bankers are losing sleep over Bitcoin. The cryptocurrency that's been on such a wild ride is finally coming to Wall Street. On Sunday, Bitcoin futures contracts will begin trading. Those are basically an investment vehicle that lets you bet on Bitcoin without actually buying the underlying asset itself. It's also a way for big institutions like pension funds to get in on the action. But some of the world's biggest banks are taking a wait and see approach. They say they fear they'll bear the brunt of the risk, like US banking giant JP Morgan, the Royal Bank of Canada, others like Goldman Sachs will only allow certain clients to trade Bitcoin futures. These middlemen also fear Bitcoin's volatility makes it hard to match buyers to sellers. Our next guest calls this a dangerous experiment. For a deeper look into the bank's position on Bitcoin future contracts, we're joined by Carl Schmada, Director of Global Product and Market Strategy at Cambridge Global Payments and friend of the program. It's nice to see you, Carl. You as well. Uh, what do you mean dangerous experiment? What is the experiment here? It's a huge experiment. I mean, that's the thing that uh, I think people don't necessarily recognize here is this is really unprecedented. We've never seen something like this before. We've never had something like this traded on an exchange. And a lot of the investors and the, and the institutions involved in it are you know sort of wading into an unknown space and so the key question is really going to be how things evolve in the next week and 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 how they evolve in the longer run explain that to me though because i mean banks come up with new products all the time right. of derivatives and mortgage-backed securities and bundled up in something new and they sell those why are those any different from something like say bitcoin primarily as you as you mentioned earlier the fact that the underlying is not moving this is something where it is simply set as a price or a reference price in uh, a range of markets elsewhere elsewhere and it's bet on on the exchange so the best way to think about that is that's effectively like you and I betting on the outcome of the next Leafs game um, and you know if if I win you pay me money if uh, if you win you uh, you you gain money <laughs> well um, I, but I mean that's what's scary here for consumers right. is that a lot of this sounds exactly like that which if you go back to 2008 yeah. which was sort of a, a a weird composition, a weird mix of unknown and a right. volatile market. This has all the makings of exactly that again. Does it that from the outside? You know more about this. Than oh, I. no question. I think I think what has happened here is that the CBO and CME, uh, both of the exchanges that are offering this product, have really provided sort of a veneer of legitimacy to this, right. um, and that suckered in a lot of retail investors. And the primary problem here is like you know, effectively, you're giving somebody who's used to riding around on a tractor a top of the line Ducati. Um, it's <laughs> highly unstable. It's going to move very, very quickly. Um, and the reality is that many, many people will have no idea how to manage the risk. And there's all these people, I hear from them every day, people saying, oh, should I, should I invest in Bitcoin? And the thing that I think has kept most of them at bay is that it's kind of complicated. That you got to download the app, or you got to go on your computer, and you got to, like, it, it's a really complicated process. Right. This takes all that complication out. Right. Are, can we expect to see a vast amount of money flow into Bitcoin, at least initially? I think as, we're already seeing that, 100%. And, and you know, the the episode that you talked about earlier, 2008, was exactly the same deal. Uh, you had the rise of ETFs around that time. You had the, the sudden availability of, of betting on oil or not gas or, or electricity given to the average retail investor, and they took a huge bath on it uh, when they did at that time. So, you know, I absolutely think you're going to have an enormous rise, rise in interest in the next few weeks, um, but at some point uh, there will be spilt milk. And what the banks are worried about, what the banks are saying is we, we, they may not clear these trades. Right. Explain for people who don't really understand how that works, why that's so important to the system, and why a lot of these banks are, are sitting back to wait and see if they'll actually do it. Right. So there's two major factors driving that. One is that a, as a bank, you have a duty to ensure that the investments that you're providing to your clients are both appropriate and suitable for the customer. And so that means that for a lot of the banks and a lot of their customers, these things are just a little bit too dangerous at this point. So they're only going to allow what they call professional level clients to trade these at least at inception. The second issue is the fact that uh, margins need to be very, very high. Margin deposits need to be very, very high. And the reason for this is you're talking about an asset that moves up and down by 20, 30% a day. Right. Um, today it's moved, uh, I think, thirteen, fourteen hundred dollars right. um, It's not, it's not, you know, for the faint hearted. Um, so, you know, what the banks need to worry about is ensuring that there's enough capital in the system to protect everybody in the, in the pool against losses. And primarily to protect themselves. Because exactly. they, they act in doing that clearing the trade. They act right. as both buyer and seller for a period of time. Right. If the margins go wild during that period of time, they, they would lose money. 100%. And the issue is that you need to be able to access the underlying market often in order to do that. Right. And, you know, yesterday was a great example. We had a divergence in price across the three major exchanges that the CME is going to use that amounted to $4,500. I mean, you had on one exchange $15,000 $15, and another exchange $19,500. Um, it was a major difference. And 
at the same time, you had an inability to buy and sell because the exchanges were swamped with demand. And so, you know, you're, right. you're in a situation where the bank is unable to offload its risk. And in the FX markets, we call this a hot potato problem. Um, you give me the potato and I need to get it off, the, off, off my hands very, very quickly. Um, and so, you know, that is all the uh, sort of market structure problems that we're looking to face in the next few weeks. And Bitcoin's traded on these private exchanges that keep crashing. I, I right. mean, Bitcoin or whatever it's called, Coinbase has crashed a few times right. at its most volatile parts. If they crash, are the banks on the hook for that? Like, is that the margin stuff? they're talking about? That's part of it, part of it uh, because the value can, can gap down. Uh, that's the right. big issue. Uh, and we see this actually in FX markets. I can't exactly, you know, throw stones. Uh, I live in a bit of a glass right. house. But, you know, in the FX market, at certain times of the day, there are not enough other, other parties in the market to provide liquidity. And so there are issues sometimes uh, in offloading a position that I've taken with a customer to a, uh, a counterparty elsewhere. So the key thing that they have to protect themselves against is that gap. They need to be able to make sure that they can take that position and move it across very, very quickly. Carl, you act sometimes as our translator in chief. It's great to get you in here. <laughs> Thank Thanks you. for this. Carl Schmada, the Director of Global Product and Market Strategy at Cambridge Global Payments.